Hi, good afternoon, everyone. We are broadcasting live from Subang Jaya Medical Center. Welcome, everyone, to this first uh, SJMC Cardiology Grand Board Round. Here, we will showcase all the cases uh, of uh, cardiology uh, by our consultant cardiologists and also our guest panelists. We are talking about cases, uh, mainly referral cases from uh, primary care physician and general practitioner around Subang and other centers. And my name is Dr. Ko Kok Wei. I'm the consultant cardiologist uh, practicing in Subang Jaya Medical Center. We have uh, Dr. Jayamala, uh, a very prominent cardiologist. Hi, Dr. Jayamala. Hi. Okay. And we have our guest panelists, uh, two guest panelists here, Dr. Choi Chung consultant cardiologist. Hi, Dr. Choi. And Dr. Hugh Fan Lee, our consultant endocrinologist. Okay, before we start, uh, we're going to, uh, I'm going to announce some uh, housekeeping. So this will be an uh, interactive, uh, interactive session. So now, if you have a smartphone, just uh, grab your smartphone. Instead of uh, log logging on to the MySejatra, you will capture this uh, Slido apps. My first time using as well. Let me try as well. So you can see in the Slido uh, apps that you can ask any question and I will be the moderator and chairperson today and I'll look through the Slido if I got time and we will answer your question accordingly. All right. And next, yeah, all right, next. Okay, so the Slido is also embedded in the page. You can just scroll down and, and, and look at the Slido and key in your questions. Okay, next slide. And also, we will be uh, having a CPD point. So at the end of the session, after this session, uh, you can open up your MMA apps and also try to screen the QR code and you'll get your MMA CPD point one point for this session. All right, without further ado, let, us, uh, let me uh, welcome Dr. Jamala, uh, who will be presenting her first case. Thank you very much, Dr. Ko. Hello, everybody, and hello to all guest panelists. <clears throat> this uh, is the SGMC Cardiology Grand Rounds, and we hope to hold it the first Saturday of every month between 2 and 3. And the first one will be shortness of breath, a common symptom. I'll be presenting, and Dr. Ko, Dr. Choi, and Dr. Hugh Fen Lee are in the panel. I'll be presenting three short cases, all between the ages of about 60 to 70. The first patient is a 66-year-old lady who has who came complaining of shortness of breath and being easily tired over the last one month. This has become progressive and she even finds it difficult to climb the one floor in her house. There's no cough, ease or chest pain. She has to sleep on two pillows and occasionally is woken up by coughing. She also feels bloated and has a problem with digestion. Three years ago, she underwent total hysterectomy for menorrhagia. And at that time, she had a heart check and she was told that the ECG and echo were all normal. At that time, she was diagnosed to have type 2 diabetes and hypertension and started on the medications as shown. She's a non-smoker, she doesn't exercise, and all her siblings have diabetes. So maybe... Uh, okay, can maybe I can just pause here. Uh, it is also an interactive session between the panelists. So maybe I'll ask Troy, what do you think, Troy? Uh, if you see patients coming with a short of breath, what are the possible causes? Yeah, so I guess uh, in the approach of... Uh, Particularly in relation to the breath, we probably have to uh, look from other point of view as well. So, compromising cardiac cause, uh, uh, respiratory, metabolic, anxiety disorder. So, not just although this is a cardiology session, we have to always think about other causes as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I shall carry on. Um, she was not, there was no leg edema, she was not pale. 
She was not really overweight. Um, there was a bit of oxygen desaturation while she was just sitting quietly. And the moment she walked to the couch and back, the oxygen saturation fell to 92%. There was resting tachycardia. Her blood pressure was 11070 and her JVP was raised to angle of jaw. Now, just to, to remind ourselves, when you measure the JVP, the patient should be propped up at 45 degrees. And the height, vertical height from the top of the JVP to the sternal angle should be less than four. Anything more than four is elevated. The JVP is hidden beneath the sternocleidomastoid. So just to show you, these are examples of JVP. And here you can see the two waves. So the heart sounds were difficult to hear. Apex beat could not be felt. Lungs sounded clear. And liver was two finger breaths below costal margin. So the diagnosis from the clinical examination appears to be heart failure. Um, so we need to find out the cause. And we did a few simple investigations. She's, She's not anemic. anemic. Her creatinine was normal. Her urea was slightly elevated, probably due to the low cardiac output. The fasting sugar and cholesterol results are as shown. To me, it looked okay, but maybe Dr. Hill can comment on it later. Thyroid function test was normal. I did not measure the NT pro BNP. Ko, would you want to measure the NT pro BNP? Do you routinely measure? Yep. So, uh, as you mentioned, heart failure, uh, I think heart failure is more of a clinical diagnosis. If you look at the definition, uh, we can diagnose heart failure even from uh, history and physical examination. And I don't routinely check pro BNP uh, unless there, there is sometimes the cases can be uh, confusing, whether it's respiratory anxiety. And then I will check the anti-pro BNP. However, I think anti-pro BNP has been a marker uh, for heart failure for a patient with stable heart failure. And you think you want to fine tune, sometimes we will check the anti-pro BNP. But yes, it is not routinely checked. All right. So maybe a question to Dr. Hugh. What do you think of a diabetic control? Are you happy with the diabetic control or HP1C 6.8? I think the uh, diabetes control is actually very good, HbA1c 6.8%, um, but we all know that uh, the diabetes control really doesn't determine the cardiovascular risk. The cardiovascular risk actually starts even before the diabetes level goes high. So we know that patients with uh, impaired fasting glucose or impaired glucose tolerance, they are already at an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. So your glycemic control doesn't determine that. But the mm -hmm. fact that somebody has diabetes, it has an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. So it's not surprising, despite being a woman, despite being relatively young, uh, that she presents with a heart problem because of the diabetes being already there. Now, the history is three years. Of course, we know that the, uh, the, the, the insulin resistance predates that. In fact, hyperglycemia may predate uh, diagnosis for a couple of years. So therefore, she could have had diabetes for longer and therefore cardiovascular risk would have increased for several years even before diagnosis. Hmm. Thanks for the comment. So, Dr. This, this is an ECG. Uh, okay, so I love ECG. Let me describe it. So if you look at this ECG, uh, what is very obvious, you can see a very broad QRS complex. So first of all, we look at whether this patient is in atrial fibrillation or not. As you know, that heart failure often associated with atrial fibrillation. Now, what you can see here, uh, the all the P wave. So when there's presence of P wave, it is not uh, atrial fibrillation. And the rate, you can see, it's very regular. So now this patient has sinus rhythm, and the QRS complex uh, was very broad more than 120 milliseconds. And you can see that in lead V1 and V2, the QRS complexes were pointing downwards, indicative a left bundle branch block morphology. Now, so this patient has a sinus rhythm uh, with left bundle branch block pattern. So, Choi, any other comments? So, 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 uh, so um, we have this very common question from uh, doctors in time to time. In patients with left bundle branch block, they come in with chest pain, for example. So how do you tell whether they are having like an anterior MI or 
you just say it's left on the left watch. How, how do you approach this? Yes, kind of a very quick question. If, in fact, this uh, was uh, commonly uh, debated uh, over our cardiology conference and uh, EP conference. Uh, for those who are very interested in ECG, they can read about, you all can read about this criteria called the SCABOSA criteria. Basically, uh, SCABOSA criteria just say that any left bundle branch block, there is a bit weird pattern. For example, if you see the V1, V2, the QRS complex is uh, pointing downward. The ST changes should be pointing to the direction opposite way, meaning that the ST should be a bit elevated. So if you see that in the left bundle branch block, QRS pointing downward, but the ST segment pointing downward or ST depression, that is the indicative of some myocardial ischemia. However, you can see that it's very confusing. So oftentimes we do uh, clinically. I don't use this criteria. I will always look at the patients, the history. If the patient comes with acute chest pain with a left bundle branch block, the first thing I still think of is whether this patient having a heart attack or not. So for those practicing alone outside in a GP, if you see a left bundle branch block patient coming with the acute symptom, please do call us or refer to us because it can be a sign of myocardial ischemia. Okay, this was a chest X-ray. Uh, Dr. Choi, you want to say something about the X-ray? Sure. So, this uh, chest X-ray, uh, the parent feature that you can see is actually the very key part. So, those in uh, you know, medical school, we use to calculate at a CT ratio. And this is definitely more than 50% of the thoracic uh, uh, here. And on top of that, over the higher areas, you can see uh, it's all congested and what we call it, the typical uh, back wings appearance. All the upper lobes seem to be uh, very markedly uh, okay. So definitely congested film. Most likely a good comrade in demand. Okay, thanks. Sir. Okay, so uh, we went on to do the echocardiogram. And uh, this is the short axis. You can see an enlarged and poorly contracting left ventricle. Uh, this is in the short axis, and this is the long axis. Uh, I'm not sure why that is not coming out. Um, all right. Anyway, um, okay, we uh, okay. We are we just left it out, and Dr. Allen to the rescue. PowerPoint is here. Uh, oh, I see. Okay. Maybe so regarding your left on the burn block. I Maybe you can. Uh, every time you see, any time yes, you see yeah. a picture with left on the branch block, is always yes. abnormal. Is that, is that correct? Yes. Yeah. All right. Always assume abnormal, especially those presenting with the acute mm -hmm. symptoms. Okay. Unless you have a ECG baseline indicator of left bundle branch block. So for those patients with a baseline ECG that is abnormal, whether it's right bundle, left bundle branch block, I always give them a copy, you know, I always ask them to photocopy and keep as though as the ECG is their IC. All right. Okay, the okay. this is, yeah, we are back. So basically it was an enlarged, poorly contracting left ventricle. And uh, all right. Okay, in the M mode, you can see the DLV is dilated, ejection fraction of 22%, and by Simpsons, it's 13%. So basically, this patient presented with heart failure. Her symptoms were going over one month, so it was chronic heart failure, and she's got heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So uh, we need to find out the causes. Dr. Ko, would you uh, want to comment about what common causes? So, so I think uh, the, the most common cause of a heart failure is uh, due to heart, hypertension or coronary disease. And sometimes it can be due to valvular heart disease. And sometimes when we investigate it and there's no other apparent cause, uh, this can be a form of uh, cardiomyopathy. Other causes are uh, relatively rare. Okay. Of course, we did a coronary angiogram and her coronaries were completely normal. So it was most likely, as Dr. Ko pointed out, a cardiomyopathy. So we have this lady who's got chronic heart failure due to LV reduced function, 
most likely due to a cardiomyopathy. A left bundle branch block on the resting ECG, which are not present three years ago, and she's got diabetes. Okay, in this group of patients, there have been many randomized controlled trials giving us level A evidence of effective pharmacological and device therapies to improve CV outcomes. So this is how the CPG in heart failure said, if these patients with reduced ejection fractions have signs and symptoms of heart failure, and in stepwise manner, you would start diuretics, ACE, beta blockers, if no signs of volume overload, or MRA, which is mineralocorticoid antagonist. I will tell you what I did. Patient refused admission. So I started her on Lasix. Of course, you can argue with me, why should I start 40 milligram on such a small size lady? I started Lasix, pyronolactone, mineralocorticoid. I stopped her amylodipine and I started perindopril 2.5 milligram daily. One week later, she was feeling better but dizzy. As expected, her blood pressure was low. I over dehydrated her. So I had to reduce her Lasix to 20 and I maintained the rest. And a week later, she was feeling better. Still a bit of resting tachycardia, BP as shown. And that's when I added on bisoprolol because we can only add beta blockers when there are no signs of volume overload or congestion. So although she's better, it's important that we add both beta blockers as well on top of ACE inhibitors. So just do not leave the patient on diuretics alone. So then I saw her four weeks later. She was feeling very good, but still the tachycardia as shown. I increased the perineal pill to optimize therapy and uh, let the isoprolol as shown. Four weeks later, it was feeling good, but I wasn't happy with the heart rate, so I increased the prolol to 5 mg and brought down the Lasix to 20 mg every other day. So she was feeling good, so I continued with these four medications. And this was the echocardiogram, which was done was about nine months later. Okay, the first one was in January, and I'm not sure whether you can appreciate that there was actually an improvement. So this was done in January, and this was in in um, October. So you can see there's improvement, and we call this reverse cardiac remodeling. Uh, and you see the same in both the short axis and the long axis views. So there's improvement. And if you look at it, this is what I showed you before, 13%. Now it is 46.6%. So I stopped her Lasix and I maintained her on all these medications. So uh, Dr. Ko, okay. would you like to? Yep, very good uh, uh, case. And I, I think I will direct this question to Dr. Choi. So very interesting question. We always ask ourselves, uh, uh, Choi, would you have started uh, this group of drug called angiotensin receptor naproxen inhibitor, or in short, ARNI, at the onset of the heart failure when you see a patient with a heart failure instead of uh, prindopril or ARP? So, thank you. I think uh, I would have done anything different other than what the surgery has done, and you can see the outcome of things. Very good. But just for the sake of discussion, ANI is actually a very interesting uh, group of therapies for this group of patients. In addition to the device inhibitor, uh, it also has this uh, thing called nephrilation inhibitor. So, what it does is it will reduce the inhibition of our natural uretic peptide, and together with the device inhibition, it will even you know, promote. Uh, uh, Residualization, reduction in sympathetic tone, and based on the studies, apparently, uh, mortality benefits have been seen. Uh, I think more and more doctors and surgical pathologists who treat heart failure then passing ANI a little bit more. And for me personally, I will start at this stage, even uh, at the hospitalization level, but then early. I expect them to be a bit more. Uh, yeah. How about uh, changing? Uh, uh, changing, let's say, the patient stable. The thing is the patient stable and NYSHA class one, 
been on uh, ACE inhibitor for a long time. Uh, would you start changing it or just maintain it on proinopril? If this patient, like we can see the EM yeah. improved, NYHA uh, 1, EDL back to 1, I would probably not add on. Uh, but if the patient is still symptomatic, yes, like what the told said, I would probably add in an RA. Mm. And uh, probably you will see a bit more improvement after that. I think I agree with you. Okay. All right. So I think another two interesting question. So in light of all these uh, SGLT2 inhibitor data, uh, would you start, maybe I ask this question to Dr. Hugh. So this patient, so this patient is interestingly, also interesting. have heart failure. Have heart failure. So what do you think hmm. of, uh, what do you think the, of uh, the patient is on general med? Would you use the SGLT2 inhibitor? Would you use the SGLT2 inhibitor? Yeah. Yeah. It's about time for the cardiologist to seek the endocrinologist's advice to treat heart failure nowadays. Huh? Uh, I, I think I think SGLT2 is a very interesting product. It started off as a diabetes product, but obviously the last the data in the last 24 months really has shown that it is really not a group, just a group of lowering uh, agent. Uh, it is a medication that would actually improve cardiac uh, function uh, and certainly treat heart failure. And certainly, we reduce ejection fraction like this patient. Um, not only that, it actually improves uh, cardiovascular mortality and renal outcome as well. So, therefore, it is a you know a lot of time we treat diabetes to reduce cardiovascular and renal uh, complications. Now we have a drug without going through the glucose actually directly deal with these complications. Now, um, would, you, would I start? I, I think uh, the data so far shows that we should. We should start early. Uh, but of course, when you have HbA1c of 6.8%, does the glucose justify changing the medication? Probably not, but there's not a reason why you're changing the medication. You're changing the medication because of comorbidity, because there's heart failure, and that's the reason why you want to switch agent to improve cardiac outcome and also uh, cardiac mortality. Um, uh, when do you switch? Um, I would switch the moment it is uh, comfortably so. Now, one of the things that uh, we need to be uh, aware of is obviously that uh, SGLT2 inhibitor for somebody who has a dicky heart, uh, you may get actually a hypotensive episode because, again, because of uh, volume changes. Uh, it does cause uh, uh, renal excretion of uh, water and therefore the blood pressure does drop a little bit. Uh, so therefore, you just have to monitor the patient carefully as we normally do with other agents. All right. But first, if you will do stop into SGLT2, there is a risk of hypoglycemia, so you may have to mm -hmm. cut back on other things, given the fact that the HbA1c is so good at 6.8%. Yep. Yep. Okay. Oh, probably this question is quite interesting as well. When would you consider device therapy? So I'm going to simplify it. I think this is uh, uh, something a bit more advanced. Uh, when we treat heart failure, most of the time we will need to optimize the medical therapy for heart failure, which is the medication. Uh, of course, uh, after excluding other causes of heart failure like coronary artery disease, if you have coronary artery disease, then you have to consider revascularization. Now, despite medical therapy, the important thing is the optimization of medical therapy. Despite that, if the EF doesn't improve and the patient remains symptomatic, and when I say that EF doesn't improve, means that the EF is generally less than 30%, then uh, implantable cardioverter defibrillator should be considered. As we all know that heart failure patient, especially in class one and class two, the mode of uh, death usually in this group of patient actually is sudden cardiac death due to cardiac arrhythmias. Now, in a particular patient's uh, group of patients where the QRS complex uh, is brought in lab bundle branch especially, they experience something called mechanical dyssynchrony. Because the when you have left bundle branch block, so the right contracts first, then later only the left. So you can see that the dyssynchrony movement itself will decompensate the heart even further. Now, many trials have already established that the implantation of CRT, CRT means something like a pacemaker, where there are leads not only to the right side of the heart, there's also leads to the left side of the heart. Uh, it paces both sides at the same time. Hence, eliminate the dyssynchrony and cause the heart to pump in synchrony. 
and this has shown improvement in patient in terms of mortality and morbidity in patient with a CRT, with a heart failure, EF less than thirty percent in the left bundle branch block. Okay, now we uh, this is the ECG. Oh, so I think in the interest of time, we we'll move on to case number case two. Number. Okay, case number two is similar lady, 72 years old, similar sort of complaint, shortness, easily tired, cannot climb the floor, uh, one floor in her house also, has to sleep on two pillows, and she had been having cough, treated as bronchitis. She has got hypertension on amylodipine 5 mg, uh, non-smoker, no family history. Not pale, but she has edema, a little overweight, Oxygen saturation 90% while sitting quietly. A bit of tachycardia, irregular. BP 150-70. JVP raised to angle of jaws. Cardiovascular difficult to hear heart sounds. Occasional crackles heard over the lungs. And liver was two finger breaths below costal margins. So basically, she too was in heart failure. Uh, hemoglobin was good. Creatinine was a bit raised. Sugar, I think she's non-diabetic. Lipids as shown. Thyroid function test normal. Anti-pro BNP was elevated at 3,504. This is the ECG. Uh, Dr. Choi, you want to comment on the ECG? Sure. So I think we approach the ECG again. The approach to ECG again, we first look uh, at the rate. Uh, in one glance, we know the rate is fast. And of course, the regularity is irregular. When we hunt for the P rays, I can't see any P rays here. Um, of course, the final details we can not talk about the axis. This is normal axis in this patient, borderline LVA. But most importantly, I think to this picture, this patient has atrial fibrillation. And just one thing I want to point out is when you look at the one, two, three, four, five, the fifth bit, um, a common mistake is that a lot of people will think that this is actually a PVC. But this is a classic example of a, a bearing speed. And in the presence of AS, it's probably the Ashman phenomenon. Because of after the third beat, there's actually a slight pause. And after the slight pause, and there's a fourth beat, and a fifth beat is actually the bearing speed. So it's typical for us to see this broad beat uh, during atrial fibrillation, uh, commonly misdiagnosed as PVT. And one way to find out is look at lead one, and lead one looks exactly like right bundle branch. So uh, this has to be a, a bearing beat. Uh, yeah, this atrial fibrillation, yeah. not controlled. Right? Okay, her chest x-ray, like the earlier lady, had cardiomegaly and there was suggestion of a bat swing. And uh, then, okay, this is her echo. And basically what the echo showed is her left atrial is dilated, but her LV function is moving very well. Her right-sided chambers are bigger than her left. Um, if I can get it to move. And... Um, moving on, uh, okay, basically what it showed was, uh, uh, we went backwards. All right, uh, this, uh, LV function is 60%, LV is normal size, her pulmonary artery pressure was elevated, TR jet is 50 plus 10, 60. So she has got evidence of pulmonary hypertension. So this lady, again, is chronic heart failure, but this time is heart failure due to preserved ejection fraction, heart LV ejection fraction more than 50%. In this group of patients, we have very limited evidence from randomized controlled trials of proven effective pharmacological or device therapy. The trials on SGLT2 inhibitors is still ongoing. So most of what our recommendations are level C evidence. Basically, the guidelines say treat the hypertension, treat over volume overload, and manage comorbidities. And this is what I did. I started Lasix 20, not 40, spironolactone. I, her BP was 150, so I wanted it to be better controlled. So on top of the amylodipine, I added perindoperil. And I chose digoxin rather than a beta blocker for rate control. We'll discuss about that later. The reason I chose digoxin was because I thought she was volume overloaded and, I was, and she was being treated as outpatient. And I gave her a, non, uh, a novel oral anticoagulant, uh, Zeralto, 
to prevent thromboembolism. So maybe go and try, you can tell me, what would you do? Would you use digoxin or would you use, think about beta blockers for controlling atrial fibrillation? Yep. So very interesting question that uh, if not nowadays, uh, I think we have uh, a lot of data emerging from the uh, electrophysiology uh, field. Huh? If you, if you, if nowadays, if I see a patient with a heart failure, with atrial fibrillation, the first thing I ask is, is the atrial fibrillation uh, new onset? So if the atrial fibrillation is the new onset, then I will need to consider whether that's the, the cause of the decompensation of the heart failure, especially the patient with an EF of 60%, preserved ejection fraction. Now, the recent data that just came out from uh, ESC, uh, just held a few days back, uh, if you enroll, they enroll a group of patients with uh, atrial fibrillation, uh, if within first year they're able to control the rhythm, so it's definitely beneficial compared to just rate control uh, in terms of uh, mobility, mo uh, mortality, and as well as the uh, stroke reduction. This is very interesting because then uh, it almost consistent with the previous rhythm control data of uh, uh, using ablation. They found that patient with a heart failure, if you ablate and able to get them back sinus rhythm, the outcome is definitely better. So I will do it differently if I will anticoagulate the patient uh, as usual, because the first thing when you talk about atrial fibrillation is stroke prevention. Make sure they are adequately anticoagulated. That rules number one, especially when if you calculate the chest score is high. But all the patients I will anticoagulate because I'm going to start a rhythm control technique which is usually I will start a, a dose of uh, oral uh, emidaron, sotalol, or even flaconite sometimes if the patient has no structural heart problem. Then I will evaluate and see whether the patient is able to convert back to sinus using medical therapy. If not, I will counsel for cardioversion because cardioversion, you can see that whether the patient responds well. Uh, if the patient is able to cardiovert with one or two attempts back to sinus rhythm, which means that the prognosis is good, means that the patient can be controlled rhythm using ablation therapy in the future. And also when they cardioverted back to sinus, you watch and see whether the heart failure improved or not. If the heart failure improved, means that they will do well with rhythm control. And this group of patients should be considered for uh, ablation therapy for atrial fibrillation. So this is a thing that I will probably fine tune in addition of medical therapy in this group of patients. What do you think, Dr. Chai? Yeah, I totally agree. And I think many times we um, uh, realize that most of the patients who are actually reverted back to sinus rhythm, they'll come back and they'll tell the same thing. I feel so much better, I can walk further, I can climb up there, I can run my dog, you know. And the moment you go back to the atrial fibrillation, they can sense the difference of the pre and post their reversion. And this this group of patients is definitely benefit from rhythm control and like what the supposed uh, vision should be considered early stage, especially this patient the LA is already enlarged. So you wait a bit longer, probably the uh return rate will be quite hard to manipulate the patient early. And just now we talk about uh, digoxin. So uh, to be honest, I've not been using digoxin for quite some time because digoxin has been quite controversial. Uh, previously, meta-analysis has shown there's a slight increased risk of uh, mortality uh, on patient digoxin. The, I think the idea behind digoxin was back in the era of uh, a firm where they think that the rate control is same as rhythm control, hence they use digoxin. So hence now I, I rarely use digoxin, or rather probably I will optimize the beta blockers first because beta blocker also can control the rate and at the same time it improves the mortality in heart failure as well. I have one question for the first Q. Um, this is a patient who is actually not diabetic, and of course, we do not know the data for reserve injection fraction uh, after the patient. I suppose that you know, uh, that you know use uh, what do you yeah, or what do you think is your role of people who is not diabetic to and so who is not diabetic and so you be if you are willing, will you be willing? Well, I think let, let's put it. As it is, if if she were not diabetic, I mean she isn't diabetic, uh, for for sure. But of course, her fasting group is five point nine in a stress situation, so it doesn't mean that she's IgT or IFG either at this point in time under stress. 
Um, if it is, if this person is diabetic, obviously you have an added reason to actually start on a medication that would actually benefit benefit cardiovascular uh, mobility and mortality. And of course, uh, the renal function is also improved with the uh, treatment as GLT2. But what if the patient is not diabetic like this one that we have in front of us? Now, the uh, emperor reduced study actually shows that even the non-diabetic, um, the renal function is also preserved. So there is a benefit beyond the um, beyond the um, um, uh, uh, the glucose control. But what is also interesting from the DAPA heart study is that for those who are actually on non-diabetic, who are actually on the SGLT2, the progression to diabetes is reduced. So, so for many, many years, the, the endocrinologists have been treating patients uh, with cardiovascular risk if they treat them well they actually reduce the referral to cardiologists now for the first time you do it reverse you actually treat them with heart failure and because the medication reduce complication of uh, progression to diabetes and also protect the kidney so the ongoing referral to develop diabetes and see endocrinologists and also the the nephrologist is much much less you're not going to be anybody's friends for for a while then okay okay we should go the last case is just a very short case. And uh, again, a 62-year-old lady, very similar sort of symptoms. One month progressive lethargy, easily tired, no cough, no chest pain. Uh, sorry, a, a bit of technical issue. You can't hear Dr. Jamala. Okay, can you hear me now? Hello? Okay. Okay, hello? Can you hear me? All right. So while the Dr. Jamala is troubleshooting the computer, okay, any other question from the, from the audience? Can we look at the Slido? Do you have a slide? Okay, so, so far there's no question from the audience. Okay, so the other choice when we talk about uh, AF atrial fibrillation. Now, if, just now I was talking about a new onset atrial fibrillation. If, it's, if I see a patient with a new onset atrial fibrillation, I always give a benefit of doubt whether I can uh, uh, manage with rhythm control. So how about patients that has been a while in atrial fibrillation, let's say more than a year, would you still consider rhythm control in this group of patients? Yeah, that's a very common uh, scenario that we face every day. Um, for me, I always go for the uh, jugular. So anyone who is in persistent or should I say um, AF a bit uh, longer than expected, I will try to cardiovert them. And the whole idea is to get them back to sinus rhythm. I can tell you 80% of the time, they will tell us the same thing. I feel so much better now that I'm in sinus rhythm. I've never known that sinus rhythm is such a pleasant kind of rhythm. You know? and and they will actually um, uh, look forward to keep their rhythm in sinus. And of course, we talk about uh, anti arrhythmia, which can be quite challenging sometimes uh, in patients with uh, comorbidities. Uh, of course, uh, if you're the right candidate, ablation is probably going to be a very good option. Yeah, this group of patients. Hmm. I tend to agree with you. So, I think Dr. Jamal is still troubleshooting. Computer, any any question from Slido? Can you? And maybe just one more thing, and I want to mention is that uh, halter. What do you think of the code? Halter for one day, or maybe halter for uh, maybe up to seven days. Do you think there's a difference in detection of taky arrhythmia, like yeah, or even more than yeah, this location? Uh, you mean the use of halter in detection of arrhythmias? So if the patient has already have atrial fibrillation. Uh, diagnosed on an ECG, probably the holter useful to determine whether the patient is adequately rate control. So in the holter, which is 24 hours traditionally, 
we are able to see the average heart rate. Uh, previously, we know that when the heart rate uh, good control, 110 and below, in atrial fibrillation, it will improve the symptom of heart failure. Of course, nowadays, we, are, we aim for rhythm control uh, first rather than just rate control. The challenging part in detecting uh, arrhythmias is actually the nature of some arrhythmias, like atrial fibrillation, when it first occurs initially, usually is paroxysmal in nature. So if you have a patient that comes in to you with palpitation, uh, and especially the patient in heart failure, you know that heart failure and AF always comes together. You cannot capture the atrial fibrillation in 12 week ECG, which is just a snapshot. So traditionally, we will just do a 24 hour holter. Uh, hopefully, we can catch any signs of irregularity or capture the AF in just 24 hours. But if you look at it, 24 hours itself is not long enough to capture the, one, uh, uh, the AF. So, what do you do in this operation? Then we have a special device called a loop recorder. It's called an implantable loop recorder, which will usually implant under the skin just in front of the chest wall. Now, this loop recorder has the benefit of able to record continuously up to three years for the battery lifespan is three years. So for those with symptoms that paroxysmal, uh, that we suspect is the age of population, then I think this would be a good uh, tool. However, also have one problem, very costly and it's invasive. So nowadays, we have a lot of uh, diagnostic tools that if patients are symptomatic, they can also monitor their own symptoms using a smartphone-based uh, device monitor. For example, I often use uh, things like cardio monitoring. And uh, certain iWatch 4 uh, has the ECG uh, monitoring application, which you can use to monitor an ECG. Actually, it's a 12 lead ECG, quite clean. So then, in, in our hospital, we have something called a rhythm monitoring, a continuous rhythm monitoring uh, that we can patch out to the patient. It's something like a previous thing we use, a uh, thing like King of Heart rhythm card. But this is the, the benefit of this is we are able to patch it and it is waterproof. You can shower with it. So, with the seven days data, it is uh, of the opportunity to capture any rhythm problem, especially paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, is higher. Okay, we are back. Okay, <laughs> all right. The third case is a very short case. A lady with very similar complaints, 62 years old, progressive lethargy and difficulty to climb up stairs and shortness of breath. She's hypertensive. She's diabetic with the medications it's shown. She used to walk daily, but except for this last one month. Clinically, there was no leg edema. She was not overweight. There was resting desaturation of 94%. A resting tachycardia of 130-70. JVP could not be seen. Lung sounded clear. Um, this was an ECG. Uh, Dr. Cole, you want to say something about the ECG? Right. So, so the ECG shows... Okay, so we, we can see a P wave. Very obvious, uh, the heart rate is very fast. So if you see a P wave with a fast heart rate, it is called a sinus tachycardia. Uh, just zoom in into lead 2 3 and ABF, the period is upright. Most likely it's from sinus. So this patient has sinus uh, tachycardia. I always uh, tell my fellow that when you see a sinus tachycardia, uh, that's not the final diagnosis. Same like heart failure. You don't end up with a heart failure. You need to always find the cause of a heart failure. Now, when you see a sinus tachycardia, you need to find out why this patient has sinus tachycardia. So, Dr. Jamala? Okay, this was a chest X-ray. Uh, uh, Dr. Choi, you would like to say something about the chest X-ray? Okay, so this chest X-ray is a bit different from the other chest X-ray. Um, um, uh, sorry, this, uh, sorry, this X-ray is a bit different. And if you look, and if you look at the heart really size, it's not, not really that enlarged, unlike the previous uh, papers, the gross cardiac megaly. I don't see the typical vaccine well. experience as well. However, the lung tissue should be slightly abnormal. You can see the opacity function and yeah, like what the figure has on that now. Maybe the lung tissue or parenchymal lung disease, cannibal, lymphadenectomy, no muscle. Okay. Um, hmm. This lady had a biopsy and it showed adenocarcinoma. 
So she had adenocarcinoma with lymphangitis carcinomatosis to cause a shortness of breath. So what we have showed over the last one hour or so, three cases, three ladies between the ages of 60 to 70, all coming with very similar symptoms of shortness of breath and lethargy. One was heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, and we have very effective medications to treat her. Second is heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And the third was actually a respiratory cause, CA lung with lymphangitis carcinomatosa. Um, I should pass this back to uh, Dr. Ko to show the QR code. Yes, oh, okay. yes, yes. So, I think some of us uh, need to log into the Slido. Maybe Dr. Allen can show the Slido QR code again. The last year, the JAYA that took me a bit might be normal. Yes, it was. <laughs> ah, that was I mean, that, that's the time probably it's useful to do, uh, uh, what do you call, order a pro BMP. So, okay, so I think we have uh, time, time to answer some questions. Okay, I think this question is probably Dr. Jamal can answer. Dr. Huh? So Jamal was our chair for the heart failure uh, guideline. What medication do you use for diastolic heart failure? So what does the CPG say? Diastolic heart failure, most of it, the symptoms are because of liver congestion or congestion. So diuretics are important. None of the other classes of drugs, whether you're talking about ACE, beta blockers, or even this fantastic group of Segubitrol, uh, Valsatan is the ANI group have been shown to have any special effect to reduce cardiovascular outcome. So most times we are just treating the symptoms of volume overload and treat the underlying causes, whether it is hypertension, whether it is obesity, diabetes, etc. So no special therapy. Mm -hmm. I agree. So we have another question from Dr. Kaur. So this, I think this is quite an interesting question. We can break down this question into a few sections. So Sadio man with diabetes, so on metformin, also have atrial fibrillation for a long time on warfarin, treated in uh, clinic kesehatan. So his AF was never converted for years. So maybe I'll break down to AF for a long time on warfarin. Uh, Dr. what do you think of the use of warfarin in uh, this era of uh, novel or anticipation? Yeah, yeah. So, the problem with warfarin uh, in ensuring adequate anticoagulation is always non reliable. A couple of reasons is just because the uh, therapeutic range can be variable depending on which broccoli we took this morning, and also the fact that sometimes you know they don't check the warfarin as well. Um, and studies have shown that the uh, TPI is not consistent. And I think we are moving towards uh, something more reliable and more consistent, like NOAX, where you take a fixed dose, uh, whether it's daily dose or uh, twice a day, and we get very good uh, therapeutic range and minus the bleeding uh, risk as well, which we may get from uh, warfarin and uh, over warfarin solution. So, this patient, if I will be the physician treating him, I will definitely uh, consider NOAX unless it's control indicated. Mm. So, yeah, and we agree. So Charles, you mentioned something called TPR. So for information, TPR means that it's time in therapeutic range, meaning that how how many times or percentage that the patient is on the INR of two to three within a period of time. So I think in most of the noise trial in Malaysia, our TPR range is about even 50, 55 in general, and that is in randomized trial. Okay, imagine that in randomized trial is so control group, your TPL is only about 55, means that you're on the range of good INR, 2 to 3 at 85%. So in, in, at, uh, in our population, in treatment, in, in, even in public, uh, private hospital, public hospital, I don't think that we can maintain this kind of uh, TTR. And hence, I think uh, novel or regulation is therefore a bit better than uh, using warfarin. Of course, I cannot generalize. The cost is the issue over here. So for those patients, if you look at the INA book, if you have an INA of within two to three all the time, then I would say probably it's okay, acceptable to maintain him on INA. If not, 
think perhaps we should uh, offer to change to uh, no X. There's a comment in Facebook, QR code is invalid. I think he's trying to scan the QR code. The Slido. The Slido with the MAD event. This is not the response. Oh, okay. So there's a comment in the uh, Facebook that the QR code is invalid. I think the you mix up with the QR code and the, the MMA code. Yeah. Uh, this is try to scan code. again. This, this is code. the code. For this this so this is the first slide. QR code is will follow. Let me let me try myself. This is for Slido. Not the MMA. Yep. Okay. Don't worry. I think uh, this is the first time for everyone. First time for me myself. I have trouble also finding in the uh, uh, QR code. So, uh, any other question? Let's see. There's no more. So, Dr. Po, this patient, uh, uh, would you cardio over the patient? Oh, yeah. Patient? Oh, yeah. Sorry. I forgot about the second section of this question. Now, I, I, I think it is not wrong. It is still acceptable for, for patients who have AF treated. Uh, for many years. Remember, uh, all these are only recently da uh, recent data that rhythm control seems to be beneficial. I think for the past uh, 30, 40 years, uh, people are holding uh, their, their belief on a firm raised trial that rate and rhythm is the same. So that's not wrong. So if the patient has been treated using rate control and patient has no symptoms, perhaps uh, you can just control with just rate control. However, uh we will probably illustrate a few cases where rhythm control is better than rate control in our subsequent uh going around show them the qr code no, no, Okay, so I think we come to the end of the session. Everyone? Yes. Have you any questions from the panelists? Any comments? Nope. Very good. So thank, thank you very much for uh, spending uh, your precious afternoon. And this is another QR code very important. It has uh, used your MMA uh, app, open our MMA app, which we're all of us going to do now. <laughs> because it's very important for us as well. We need to get a CPD point. So there's one CPD point here. Scan code, scan QR. Yeah, my app crash. Oh, my... Not this one. Oh, sorry, sorry. I already got. No, wrong one. So this is a wrong QR code. Sorry, sorry. Okay. Our tech support also. also uh, first time doing this. <laughs> For information, our tech support is Dr. Alan Tate. Uh, yes, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, appreciate it. Your Danish phone is the one which talked about. Yeah. So, which one is the. Give me a second. Okay, in a second. The... Okay, in a second. The... Just stay tuned for a while. We are generating a new code for the MMA CPD point. So everybody will get a, a point for your Danish talk. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was for our journal club. Click on the wrong event. So anyway, they got your one point. <laughs> they got your one point. For the wrong talk. For the wrong talk. So you can go to, when it comes out of video, you can get another point. <laughs> So for the first time, you can you all can get two points lah. One plus one. <laughs> okay, here, uh, about five minutes. Okay, uh, let's take a break. Ask questions. Any, any other questions? questions? Yeah, any other questions? Well, I guess it's uh it's good to remind everybody that whenever you see a left bundle branch block ECG, it's always not normal, as opposed to seeing a right bundle branch block. So to refer them out to the uh, tissue center for further evaluation. And of course, you see the population, not always just control. You can control is uh, being uh, more quite effective right now. And I think it's just a good system. Yeah. Does it matter? Um,
This one, this one. Okay, so maybe I, I while waiting, uh, let's ask the audience what we actually wanted for the next uh, cases. Because we are still thinking what, what cases that we want. Maybe just uh, type in, in in the comment, in the Slido, or even in Facebook. So what type of cases that you all want? You need to know our, our friend and colleagues outside there, what they actually want. So what do they find is helpful for them? Okay. So it's a case uh, discussion or the PCG discussion. Okay. Or you want more didactic lecture? A bit boring, huh? For the sequence of guidelines. And the... Uh, so you can talk to the, a bit about the SJMC CME website and uh, that we will be putting up ecgs and stuff like that just check out oh yeah we have it we have so it. we are going to we are going to oh, yeah, Malajan, uh, mentioned that we have we are planning to include our uh, educational material ecg teachings uh, uh, maybe the webinar session in our website soon so stay tuned there's a new, new thing and um okay the qr code for this particular is coming still but you all are very lucky you if you had caught the first qr code you would have had two points <laughs> one, for it, or one for the wrong talk and the other one is for the, the webinar that you just attended and subsequently this will be put on our website at the sgmc website which uh ellen Tay will also show you it will also be on the MME through the health press. Uh, okay, I'm going to correct it now. Huh? Okay, one of the doctors uh, mentioned about it, and they want to know how um, to investigate and manage a pedal edema. Perhaps the next session we arrange with a nephrologist, uh, a cardiologist, and maybe a vascular surgeon. Uh, to discuss an interesting case on Peter Edema. Whether it's unilateral or bilateral. Mm -hmm. Okay, the real article is coming up. All right. Give me a second. Oh, my God. Right. Don't worry, everyone will see <laughs> until the QR <laughs> <They need record. laughs> Uh, is it the uh, everyone? Yeah. Okay, you can see the screen now. That's the ah, QR wow. code for this session. Scan. All right. Scan, everyone scan. Get your one point. Yeah, got it. Correct. Shortness of breath. Yes. There's some, there's some uh, question on Facebook. Facebook uh, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that will be the next time. Bilateral. Okay, you want to tell us about the uh, uh, video yeah. recording? Now the this module. I just just. I will post this link in the uh, in the slide up so they will be able to see the link. Now. So will you be going through the CME portal to the SGMC? Yes. Sir. But then we must tell them how to go to the SGMC website. Hmm? What is the SGMC website? I don't know the portal link. No, you can then just say you can go to the www.sgmc and then from there it will go to here. So, Alan, for those who are unable to attend today live, so they can find this module online? Yes, I'm going to post okay. it right on now. Uh, uh, the link, all right, to which is to the uh, SGMC website. website. Uh, not to my job yep. board for them to get this and any others online thing. So, if you can also visit uh, MC Simon Dabi, uh, 
you have to tell them I'm not I'm going to microphone. Okay. Uh, Okay, so this video, for those who didn't get the point, you can either do the whole thing uh, by tomorrow. It'll be, you can either go to the DOPS online CME board or it could go through the SGMC CME website, which is www.subangjaya medical center. Subangjaya Medical Center dot uh, com dot cme dot resources. Once the end, uh, that will take you to the website. I will uh, post the links in the slide which is clickable. All right. So I'll just show, the show one the... more time. Show the code one more time for those who, for those who didn't okay. pick their points. You can have your point again. And for those who didn't manage to take it online, you can uh, get it offline by listening to the video and answering two or three questions. Okay. All right. Okay. So uh, again, thank you for uh, listening, tuning in to the live broadcast uh, for SGMC Grand Walk Round. Uh, thank you very much to Dr. Shamala. Thanks to our panelists, Dr. Q and Dr. Choi. So uh, very. Uh, good, uh, have a good weekend, everyone, and hope to see you back next month uh, on the first Saturday at the same time. All right. Bye. Thank you.